Billy was the kid whom everyone in his family and hometown of Sanger Grandi pampered. He was actually born in Charlieville, as it was the custom in East Indian families for expectant mothers to go to their parents' home to deliver their babies. His father Ishmael and mother Shamshun Ali welcomed him into this world on June 3rd, 1956. The sixth of seven children, he was named Shabil. In those days, Ishmael worked on a farm and Shamshun worked from home as a seamstress and owner of a small variety shop. Growing up in the diverse village of Sanger Grandi, Billy, as he was fondly called, enjoyed helping around the home, tending to the kitchen garden and the chickens. Being very good with his hands, the resourceful Billy built his own bicycle from used parts. He also enjoyed sports, especially cricket, but one of his favorite pastimes was to get lost in the world of cinema on Saturday afternoons. Do you remember anything about Dad's childhood? Well, from what we've heard from our aunts and uncles, they were a very close-knit family, mm -hmm. and you know, they all had responsibilities around the house as, you know, as expected, but they also loved, you know, Dad loved his sports, his cricket, his football, marble pitch, and we know about his love for, you know, cycling. He loved his bicycles and so on. And he would be back and forth between Sandy Grandi and uh, Charlieville. As I heard, he attended Charlieville Astra Primary School. Uh, during the week, he would stay with the grandparents. And on weekends, he would go back home, which would have been in Sandy Grandi at the time. So after primary school in Charlieville, he did go back to live in Sandy Grandi, where he attended Northeastern College for his secondary school education. And in Sandy Grandi was where he met Imam Noor, who was the Imam of the Sandy Grandi Masjid in the 1960s. And they became very close at such a young age as well. How I get in connection with Mufti Fam, Shabir Tamadi is, Mufti Shabir used to come as a little boy to my Mokyam. And you know, long ago, I don't know if it still happened now, but Mufti Shabir parents would keep a little reading every Thursday night. So that's how I was very acquainted with them, by going by them and and, and uh, reading and uh, sitting down and having dinner and different things. So we, we get very attached, early o'clock. I'm starting to get a sense of what life would have been back then in San Grande. Well, it's interesting. I always like to hear what it's like growing up, even Dad's experience growing up in San Grande as well. Well, it's about, about probably half a mile from his house to the masjid. So riding bicycle was probably a hobby he had. Because not only that, he used to ride to go all Tamana, which is about seven miles from here, and ride to all the parts of the country, you know, because they didn't have much vehicle at the time. And even today, you know, we have people who like riding, and he had one of those who had like riding. He liked to repair watches, he liked meeting people, he liked swimming, he liked fishing. And then, as, 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 as a youth, then we would get involved in some of these social events. Mokti Shabir was probably about 14 and I was already about 25. So the age group was not that bad, but you know, we grew up as, as people of the same age group. He was very you know, diligent and devoted, you know. He wanted to probably, he probably had a, a vision to be able to, to cope you know, and to, to want to know more than I had already learned. Most of the time we study the Quran together, or the Hadith together, and you know, certain points I couldn't reflect on, he should publish like, like this, you know, and like that. And you know, so he was really an inspiration for, for me also to be able to 
push up that far. As you know, dad, dad spent a lot of time outdoors. He always loved outdoor activities and I guess that's where we got it from, you know, the cycling and I picked up the motorcycling and you grew up riding a lot of bikes and all that too. So he had a love for the outdoors, for sure. He always thought balance was important in every aspect of life. And dad was like any typical youngster. But I wonder what, you know, growing up in Sandy Granny and going to Maktab was mm -hmm. like back then. Maktab classes and they were sitting on a bench holding a book in your hand. And we had boys and girls together. And um, Mufi Shabir was one of the eight students who was for a wonderful better world. He always excelled in the other children. And, you know, he, he keep pushing me, you know, to be able to be a, a little more vigilant in, in my studies and trying to know what I didn't know. And probably because of this, you know, I have learned so much. In 1970, the Tablighi Jamaat an Islamic missionary movement visited Trinidad from Gujarat, India. During their visit, they spent some time at the Sankar Gandhi Masjid where they piqued the interest of the teenaged Shabil. So according to one of the stories I heard, a dad and uh, I think two of his friends were passing by the Masjid, the mosque, and I think the, the mosque was open and they looked inside the window those days the masjid used to be mainly opened only for the Friday prayer, the Jummah Salat. Yes, and apparently he saw men sitting in a circle dressed yeah. in all white Muslim garb and one was reading from a book. Abdul Hafiz Mania, who led the group, is reported to have said that the 14-year-old Shabil walked into the masjid to see what they were doing and was so intrigued that he made it a regular stop after school. Dad even spent his summer vacations with the Tablik Jamaat moving about Trinidad and Tobago okay. and he would spend 40 days with the Jamaat. Yes, actually I think that's where he met Mona Abdul Salam, uh, who was from Point Fortin. At that time he had just accepted Islam and after he embraced Islam, they became you know, very close um, through the work of Tablik Jamaat, of course. That was the beginning of our friendship and I, I looked to him more as a, as a teacher and as an elder because I was new to Islam and he, so I looked at him with respect, more respect, but he, that's the beginning, of, that's when the friendship started then. He looked pure, I just saw purity in him. That program ended on a high note as Maulana recalls. That culminated with the, was the Jamaat from South Africa, three people, comprising of three people, Maulana Mangira Salim, Bashir Bai, and Ibrahim Padia. So, it was a, an invitation. They were inviting us and encouraging us to go to India, to go to India to, to study and become like alims, maulanas, and come back to the country to teach because the Jamaat realized the need, they became aware of the need of Islamic knowledge, Islamic awareness, and they were concerned about Muslims in this area, West Indies, South America, and they, were, they had the figure and worry for the, the growth of Islam in this part of the world, so they invited us to go to India. The 10 of us, we went to India, and we spent four months in Tablik, moving around, and after the four months, then six of us would remain to study, and the other four would come back to Trinidad. Yes, Molana's recollection of that time reflects exactly how dad felt, I'm sure. Well, the first four months in India were very hard months because we were not accustomed to the climate, to the food, and then moving around in Tablik from most to most. So, you know, it was kind of hard on us and we were very, we were very homesick. I should say myself and Mufti Shabir. Mufti Shabir and myself we were very, very homesick. The others were dealing with it, they were coping. But Mufti Shabil and myself were very homesick and we used to cry a lot for, for home and the family. And, um, but it, it exposed us and made us, made us seasoned then, made us better. So that when we went to Bangalore, to the Madrasa in Bangalore, when we went there, we felt, we felt better because now coming to Madrasa is, you're going to get your own room, it's going to be hostel, 
So you have your own privacy, you have your own bed, you have your own room, your own companions, hotel room, and the toilets and the bath. It's like a, it was like home then, coming home after being on, like on the streets, masjid to masjid to masjid to masjid. But when we arrived at the madrasa in Bangalore, and we met our principal, Maulana Abu Saud, he, I would never forget that morning that we arrived in Bangalore and we met him. He, it was at the time of Fajr Salat, and he welcomed us with a smile. He had his turban on, a romal, and that beautiful, bright, shiny face, and that million dollar smile. And he welcomed us, and that smile always remained with me. And we felt, we felt some peace. We immediately became connected with him. Hazrat Maulana Abu Saud Ahmad was indeed a highly learned Islamic scholar in India. The Amir of Sharia for the state of Karnataka in 1960, he founded the first Arabic college in the state, which he named Darul Ulum Sabilur Rashad. Started with seven students in 1960, today this college is the largest center for Islamic education in Karnataka. He, he played a very crucial, important role in our staying in India. The one who sent us to Bangalore, he was a great wali, was a great sheikh. He was the Amir of Tablik at that time, known as Hazrudji, Sheikh Maulana Inamul Hassan. It is said he was blessed with the gift of kashf, foresightedness, that, that's, that third eye, that mental perception. He looked at us and sent us to Bangalore. And he made a wise choice because had he not sent us to Bangalore, I don't think we would have made it. Because he looked at us and with that vision of his, that deep vision of his, seeing these six boys, English speaking, Bangalore is moderating temp temperature as well as there are people who speak English in Bangalore, everything. He made a good judgment and sent us to Bangalore. The principal, his role was very, very important because he was like our mother and father. While Dad was studying in India back then, his entire family migrated to Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there were no emails, <laughs> WhatsApp and whatnot back then. So they were all, all students, foreign students would wait for letters yeah. and that's how they would communicate. And uh, his sister would write about how the chickens is, etc. <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing the other guys will have a good laugh at that. <laughs> I, I just spoke about that. I actually remember our auntie, well, Soraya is a question. We, we fondly call her Auntie Zuri, our youngest aunt. Uh, she would give me stories along with our grandmother, Mama. Uh, Dad would write to them. Of course, letters would take weeks back then mm -hmm. about the price of butter and the price of milk in India as comparison to back home in Trinidad. But, you know, regardless, Dad and his other co colleagues who he went to study with, they adjusted well to, you know, madrasa life, different country, different place, different language. And, you know, Dad even, from what I understood, became a favorite of some of the teachers. Also, who was very instrumental was Professor Nayar Rabbani. He was very fluent in English. So he liked us a lot and we could, we could have sp spoken to him, as Hazrat Nayar Rabbani. So we settled in and Shabil was, mashallah, a model student. I would say that Mufti Shabil became the favorite of the Qari, the teacher who would teach Quran, teach Kirat. He was a very famous Qari of India, very rare Qari. He was known as Qari Azhar Sahib from Bihar. Mufti Shabil was his favorite student. So he would call Mufti Shabil his room and treat him and but he wouldn't call him alone, so we would go to, so we would, we would reap from, from Mukti Shadu's benefits from his association with the Ustad. Overall, Shabil spent eight years in India. During that time, he became proficient in the Urdu and Arabic language. Before graduating from Darul Ulum Sabalur Rashad in June 1980 as a Maulana and Kori, he visited Trinidad with his principal. I think it was in the year 1977, if I'm not mistaken, around 1977, he paid a visit to Trinidad with Mufti Shabil. He saw the place, saw everything. 
But even before that visit, it was as though he was seeing these boys from West Indies and as though he was looking at South America and the Caribbean and training us to go back and become ambassadors of the Prophet وسلم, and flag bearers of Islam even before his coming to Trinidad. But when he came here and he saw the level of Islam and the level of Tajweed and pronunciation of Quran, he became even more determined in building us and equipping us to come back and to open a madrasa and for Islam to rise in these parts. Mum mentioned that her father, Maulana Ismail Adam, respectfully known as Mulvi Adam, had a great admiration for Dad. Mm -hmm. And he approached Dad concerning marriage. Yes, actually in 1978, Bari Hajrat, you know, who was like a, his, his principal, uh, um, his mentor, a father figure, he came to Trinidad in 1978 and performed the nikah or the marriage ceremony between mom and dad. I know we affectionately call him Bari Hajrat, but you know, Bari is like a term of endearment, it really means big in Urdu. Yes. You know, so a person of, you know, um, Bari Hajrat, whose real name is actually Mona Abu Saud Ahmad. And his son, Mufti Ashraf Ali, who was also a teacher of dad, is who dad named me, the name Ashraf, after his teacher. And of course, you know, your name, Arshad, comes from, you know, Sabila Rashad, from the word Rashid, yes. you know. <coughs> and from Sabila Rashad, we got Rashad Avenue here in, in, um, in Kunupia, where the Darulam is currently located, and where the girls' college and even the boys' college started, where we live, home in San Juan, Rashad Avenue. And all, alhamdulillah, many years after we have the Rashadi Foundation. So mom joined dad in his last couple years of uh, study in India. And he also taught her when he came back to Trinidad. That would have been from 78 to 81. He taught mom at home as well. Yes, because after he uh, graduated from Bangalore, you know, as an alim, as an Islamic scholar, he went on to further his studies in the field of Ifta, which will become a mufti, yes. at Dabel Jamia Islamia. You know, a, a mufti, we use the term mufti, somebody who is based in, somebody who is versed, sorry, somebody who is versed, um, an expert in Islamic ruling, you know, Sharia law, legal decisions according to Sharia law, etc. Yes. Mufti Shabil Ali returned to Trinidad from India in September 1981. He lived briefly in Baratari with his in-laws before moving to San Juan and attending the Nuri Islam Mosque. Wasting no time in putting his studies to use, he taught classes for children and adults there. Yeah, well, for one year, we, we, had a, we had a meeting, a big meeting in Monroe Masjid, where the elders and the brothers of Tablig, we all sat together and we had a, a mashwara. It was decided that Mufti Shabil would, this place would be Sawa, Nur Islam Mosque, and I would stay in Monroe, I would come there. He would establish classes, maktab. So he started in Nur Islam. He taught maktab there, and I stayed in Monroe and taught maktab there for about one year. So we worked with the people first. And that was also the advice of the principal that you go back, do not get yourself involved in any controversial affairs. And our principal's message to Mufti Shabil and myself and to us was go back there and win the hearts of people. He had a class for me. I would say five or seven days a week, I'm not sure, to the amount, but I used to go every Tuesday for his classes in the mosque, in the Nuri Islam mosque. A great, great experience, you know, to probably to, to understand or to probably share. Um, you know, I am one of those persons, you know, who always like, you know, people to excel me. And if I am responsible for you to be excel and hide with the style, I, I don't mind. I have no animosity for people who like being just the, the, the teacher and probably, you know, they could come back to teach me. Not that it's their pleasure. He might have been a scholar, but he always admitted that, that I was his scholar and he could not lead a special prayer if I was present. He would join. He would probably give the lectures, give the classes, whatever have you. But, you know, you will never leave the person if I am present. When I asked a question, I said, Will you be Mufti? He said, No, do my style. So I have to respect you. 
despite it might not be written correctly, but still, you know, I feel an honor to let you lead the prayer and not me. That really cherished his relationship with Imam Noor, who was self-taught back then. I suppose that's why Dad was really well known, for he was one of the very few highly trained Islamic scholars back then. Yeah, but you know, the, the stipend he received from teaching, you know, the, the allowance or the income at that time would have been very minimal, you know. So I guess, you know, maybe because he needed another form of income, a little more to survive, he got into, you know, a part time trade as a salesman. You know, I'll, he would have learned from his brother in laws or uncles, Shabir and Farouk. And he sold, you know, household items and some clothing, curtains and so on. He did that for a couple of hours, a few days for the week. Maybe I have a little extra income and so on. After a couple of years doing sales and being a successful salesperson, Dad felt as though he was being sidetracked mm -hmm. from his real commitment that he made to his principal in India to open a dar room right here in Trinidad. Yes, actually, that sales didn't last too long, I think. The same year I was born, 1982, was the year he gave up that, you know, sales, you know, the studying on the, on the streets and so on, because he wanted to focus more, and at the same time, you know, be totally independent and not under one of the Muslim organizations at the time. He wanted to teach, you know, his own stuff as much as he wanted, freely and so on. So that, that's the, more or less how the Darulam started, the same year I was born. So that's why, um, that's why I keep track of my age, because every year was the annual yeah. Jal graduation. It's the same age as me, so I think we just enter in uh, 38 years now. Yes. Of Shabil alayhi rahma was, even though it was his home, I mean, he never policed us. You know, he wasn't regimented. Um, the classrooms were small. Uh, well, actually, we had one classroom, and that was his garage. So in the morning, you know, we will, um, he will drive out this car, we will pack up the desk. In the evening, he will remove the desk, pack it in one corner, and he will pack his vehicle there. Um, there were only about, I think it was about four of us in a room staying there. It had a big yard, and um, during break time for school, you know, that, is, that was our play area. It was something new to Trinidad, that, that kind of uh, institution. It was new to us, right? A balance between uh, Islamic and academic it was something new. So it was, uh, the environment was very, very, very uh, welcoming, uh, especially to teenagers who um, grew up in this multicultural society. And you never really had 100% Islamic and Islamic environment so, but because some of us grew up in a Muslim home, you know, we kind of uh, adapted quickly to it. My father and Mufti Shabi Alahi Rahma are very good friends from way back when. And um, when Mufti Shabi Alahi Rahma came to Trinidad, came back to Trinidad, he, my father was one of the first people that he asked to help him establish the Darul home. So my father was his student and his friend and he assisted in establishing the Darulum. He is one of the founding members of the Darulum. So uh, I would say that that influenced my being a student here, but also Mufti Shabi Alayhi Rahma taught me at the local um, maktab class at Nur Islam Masjid. And I remember, I have this memory of, uh, of him teaching there, and one day I went back home and my this is like uh, probably before I wrote Common Entrance. My dad asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I say, I want to be Mufti Shabil. <laughs> I, I didn't even know what that is, you know. Um, but I, so, so my dad said, well, you know, he's going to open a school. And um, he will be teaching there if you want to go to the school. So I say, yeah. At that time, I didn't have a school. There was nothing here. Um, as you would know, the school was established under his house in Sao. So I attended school there for probably half of one school year before it was moved up to Kunupia. And then where well, we had one building here which housed the school, the offices, the kitchen, everything. And that's how I started here. And uh, that's basically how I was influenced to study here. Founded in 1984 with very humble beginnings at Mufti's home, the Darul Ulum began with the establishment of the Boys College 
which expanded from the garage to the downstairs of Mufti's home. Several students came from impoverished backgrounds, but as many confirmed, he never turned anyone away. It was during the August holidays, and um, we did speak to him. He very calmly suggested that, you know, we have to take, do the entrance exam and see exactly what it is, you know, where we could head with it. And um, one thing that stands out at that time, actually, there was the issue of the student fees. And, um, well, we're not from a very wealthy background or so. So my brother from one road, he decided that he would pay the fees for me. Um, he met with Mufti Shabil in my presence and told him here what? He will pay for the full eight years up front. But um, he indicated that it wasn't a problem. Mufti Shabil indicated that. So we just, he just paid for one year, and after that we paid it like term by term. In my opinion, he was trying to get people from across Trinidad, right? And um, it, it worked out in a way, because even at that time, in my class, there was one guy from Mikakas, one from Sandy Grandi, a couple from Central, and one from Sawa area as well. In 1986, through a generous donation of land in Kunupia, the Darul Ulum moved to a home of its own. Formerly opened by its patron, Maulana Abu Saud, the boys' college began with one building. By 1986, the girls' college began at Mufti Shabil's home and later also moved to its own campus in Kunupia. By 1994, when Mufti Shabil's wife had completed the Alima program, she was appointed principal of the girls' college and still holds that position today. The Darul Ulum Trinidad and Tobago kept expanding quickly, becoming the first Islamic institution of its kind in the Caribbean and South America. Mufti Shabil had this, this foresightedness about things. Um, he would think far into you know, the future. I didn't say, I, I'm not saying that he knew the future, but he was a thinker and a very deep thinker. Mufti Shabir Alayhi Rahma was a visionary in education, one unlike that what we have seen in our times here in Trinidad and Tobago, or even in most of the Western world. When he came back from India, he had this vision that an alim should not be someone who is aloof from society and unable to interact with people. It, there was a problem at the time when he came back from studies, and it was that ulama would come back and they would not be able to come down to the level of the everyday person in society. And he strived to, to alleviate that problem. And that was a vision that he had. And that vision was transferred into our education. He will call people he knew, friends and relatives, and make them learn under him to ensure that they will learn the basics of Islam. That is all. You know, he wanted the basics. If you want to further your studies, that's up to you. But the basic, you must know. Actually, our current principal, our respected Mufti Wasim Khan, you know, he speaks about the responsibility that had on his, on his shoulders even back then. We met in 1991 officially and started our relationship, a student-teacher relationship. And then working under him when I graduated in 1992, so I became a full-time teacher. And besides becoming a full-time teacher, um, because of his uh, many duties he had to perform and responsibilities, um, he had made me in charge of the department of IFTA. You know, so all questions coming in, I had to research, give the answer, show it to him, he will go over it. If he needs an adjustment, modification, he will do it. We will sit down, we will discuss, you know, many, many issues affecting the Muslim community, whether it's marriage, divorce, custody of children, maintenance, land distribution, and so many, you know, issues that normally affect family life, as we know very well. So 
After that, 1992, he continued. He was the principal. He was the chairman of the school also. And then when he officially, when more and more members came in, he officially formed uh, an official administrative committee. And I was part of that administrative committee along with other members uh, who are still here. And then I used to be the secretary, the recording secretary of all our meetings. You know, so I will document it, show it to him, and we'll keep it in record. But because Darulam was basically in its initial stages there where qualified graduates were now coming in one after the other. Um, he alone had to do everything with respect to finance, fundraising, with respect to building, maintenance of building, with respect to hiring workers, you know, allocating their salaries and also describing their job, like job specs. He had to do everything and he did it well. He alone, so in those days, everybody was Mufti Shabil. Everybody on the tongue because he had to do everything. And even though we were quite young, you know, my I still remember a lot. My memory, you know, I can recall. Although Dad was really busy with Darulum because his inception, you know, as Mom would say, Darulum was like his baby, like a child as well. It never deprived. We were never deprived, you know, of you know go, going to the beach. He always made time for family. I'm sure you will remember, you know, every other weekend, Dad would take a drive down Charleville. You know, we take us with him, and we would start on one side of the highway and finish on the other side because he has family on both sides of the highway in Charlieville. His aunts, his uncles, his cousins. He would go and look for everyone, old, young, everyone. So, you know, we were really attached to the Charlieville family growing up because his um, siblings all lived in Canada. So he would go and visit his extended family, cousins, aunts, uncle. Like I said, he was very much into sports as well, and I think that's where you got it. Right, and uh, ever since, I think you're the one who was all out, extreme, you go extreme in sports. And all the sports that I know, I can say thanks to you and dad. I'm not much of a sports person, as you know. <laughs> but um, even through the, through the different vacations, holidays, etc., as you just mentioned, dad would make sure to take us around the country. Sometimes we'd be very educational tours as well, the Pitch Lake, Point of Pair, all these different places he would take us. Yeah, I remember. By the age of 10 years old, 9 years old, I already knew how to, how to get a last quivers, or Matura, or Ikakas, or Toko, because we had already seen all the places of Definitely. interest <laughs> by that, such a young age. I mean, apart from all the fun and the games and the fun we have going out, me and you can bear witness, we both know that will come after we finish our schoolwork, homework, you know. You know, we are blessed in that sense, we never went to lessons, any extra lessons for common entrance or whatever, but Mom and Dad always, you know, would teach us lessons at home, and um, we both excelled in common entrance. We both passed for Hillview College, and I'm sure you can remember if we didn't perform as required by Dad, you get a little school, you know, what you call a little licks back <laughs> in the day, and then you might you, know, you might hear, okay, well, no beach tomorrow, or no drive until you understand this of lesson or that lesson, both secular and Arabic Hadith and Islamic at the same time. Dad didn't leave room for failure. Definitely. Yeah, he was a perfectionist, he was an all-rounder. Uh, there was nothing out like a plan B. <laughs> make plan A work, and I think I, I still have that in me. Always make things happen. I consider him of the as a, as a visionary leader, an all-round leader, in the sense that he had this vision of merging both the academic and the Islamic, which was something that was not really so much present in Islamic institutions. So it was something like first of its kind then, especially in the Western world. Um, but he was holistic in the sense of development is not only with respect to education, but you know, it gives the opportunity for students to, 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 to show their, their, um, their ability in sports. He would play with us, you know, and even in sports, he would be talking and laughing and joking with us. And we appreciated that. We understood that he used to wear different hats. When he was a principal, you know, you need to respect that. When he was given advice, he was like a mentor to us. We would respect that quality of him. And here, you know, when it is that in the, in the field with us playing football or playing cricket, you know, he would play like, you know, sometimes you'll see the, the, the child part of him came into being then. And as I'm talking and laughing and joking, not in any disrespectful way or anything that would bring down the esteem that he has, but really, you know, it displayed his all wrong character. One thing we noticed with Mufti Shabil is that even though he was much older than us, 
he was always the first person at the cricket field, or the first person with the football. You know, he's always the first person. I mean, I thought he could only play cricket and football, so I decided to play him a tennis match, and he beat my bad. So he was a professional tennis player. He was a professional swimmer and diver. An all-rounder, unity among Muslims was very important to Mufti Shabil. He was a founding member of the United Islamic Organization of Trinidad and Tobago, the UIOTT, and held the position of chairman for two consecutive years. Mufti Sab, being um, the leader that he was, he, in fact, was the chairman of the UIO for many years. I was fortunate to be involved in it at a certain time, not as a member, but he would have us there sitting and serving the members of the UIO. And I'm sure many of the members would probably remember us serving them tea and water and drinks and snacks and so on. But he would give us that type of um, involvement to, to, to sort of open our eyes and open up our mind to that overall unity that, that should exist amongst the Muslims. So he was very instrumental in keeping the Muslims in Trinidad united. You know, there are many people who interacted with Dad at different points, at different levels in his life. You know, many of his earlier students went on to, you know, Alhamdulillah, even became teachers at the same institute that Darulam Trinidad to be able to be. There are some like Sheikh Fazil. Uh, he was not a student at the Darulum, but he has taught at the Darulum for over 30 years. Where I was teaching before, I was teaching Arabic, but just basic Arabic to learn to read Arabic basically. And I was doing a little bit of Islamic history as well. And then I was teaching history and Spanish and maths and science. So while I could have done those things, it wasn't really my field that I wanted to do. And when Mufti Shabil asked me to come across here, you know, it was, it was like, you know, it was like a joy, you know, and because this is exactly what I wanted to do with respect to teaching Quran and Hadith and Sirah and all these things. So it was a big, big, big opening for me. It was a big blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal, a great blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal, and I, I took it with open arms. He was a disciplinarian, but loving because even though at that time, you know, you could have given some licks to the students. So a lot of them got some licks, but they loved them. There's no student who passed through Darul Ulum who tell you that they didn't love Mufti Shabil, except maybe one or two for whatever reason. But the majority of the students, even the ones who got the most licks from him, they loved him. Because the way he would be with them, he would be firm, yet gentle and calm and making jokes and having them play sports, giving them uh, lots of uh, feast and all that during Ramadan, outside of Ramadan, you know, he would come one day and say, okay, from lunchtime, we're going to have a cricket match. You know, just like that, you know. So he, he, he was, he, he, he did a lot of things impromptu, but it was very pleasing to the students and to the teachers as well. Apart from establishing the Darul Ulum, being a teacher, principal, and administrator, Mufti Shabil's dedication to the development of Islamic education led him to writing and publishing. He published several books, which are still used today, both locally and internationally. Some of his manuscripts were published posthumously, while others are in use by the Darul Ulum. Well, they, those books are still being studied here. So he died in 1996, that's almost 24 years ago, almost a quarter of a century. And we are still studying those books in the, in the Form 1 to Form 5, right? Um, a bit of it has been done as well in the Alim program, the Higher Islamic Studies program, as well as the Saturday classes. You have those, a lot of those books being studied, as well as people around the country in Trinidad and outside of Trinidad as well, they are uh, using his books and notes on them. Because what he attempted to do, and he did it to, to a good degree, was to, to facilitate the knowledge basic knowledge of Quran, Hadith, um, the Sirah, the Tajweed and all those things so that people, the general populace can be, would be able to read or at least follow and they would pick up the knowledge from that. So it was, it, I, it, I don't know what he would have done if he was still alive, definitely, because um, he had, he had a, a, you know, a, a knack for, for making things easy for people who, are, who want to study whatever sort of knowledge they want you know, whatever science they want to do from Islamic perspective. He now took 
those topics from the Arabic and the Urdu texts and so on, and then simplified it in a form that the English speakers and people who are new to, you know, newly studying about this topic would be able to appreciate. So, so he has that he had that ability of taking very complex thing and then you know breaking down to, to the level and the understanding of the of, of students. One of the things that always stood out about Dad to me was his his ability to always allot time to things that were important to him, to the development of people and by extension communities. Yeah, you know, I was always, I always of the opinion that Dad lived a full life. You know, even though when he passed away, he was just shy of 40 years old. You know, I was, remember I was in Hillview at the time, in Form 2. You were just finished Standard 5, awaiting common entrance results. But, you know, um, it, it was a very tough time for both of us. It took, it took many, many years to get adjusted, you know, a lot of sadness mixed with depression, a lot of things to, to overcome at such a young age, you know. But I always, I am thankful, we both are thankful that when we look back on the memories we have with Dad, I always say he lived such a full life. Although 39 years old is relatively young to you know, pass away, but you know, we have memories of doing everything with dad, whether it's you know, going to vacations, we made little trips to you know, visit the family in Canada, in Florida, Tobago, we go down the islands. You know. He played cricket with us downstairs, of football. You know, he would take us to see cricket in the Oval. I remember he loved his cricket. You know, you would go and see test matches <laughs> one day. He would be driving and listening to his cricket on the radio. You know, sure. so I guess that's really where the whole sports, you know, <laughs> came from. Dad had been ailing for quite some time with cancer. And I remember it was in April of 96 when Dad passed. I was awaiting the common entrance results, actually. Um, his last words to us, I think you would also remember this, where he clearly mentioned it was just two things. Yeah. It seems so simple back then, but as I grow old, I understand that they are so much of a deeper meaning to it. Mm. He said, listen to mommy yeah. and become alims, which is like Islamic scholars. Islamic studies. Yes. Yeah. I, I've never witnessed a janaza or being present in that type of situation where Mufti Shabir was. I was close to him in the sense that when he was ill, I used to actually take him to the doctor. Sometimes he requests for me to do those particular things and drive him out and bring him back and so on. And knowing that he was sick, you know, it was kind of challenging, but to, to see him pass was one thing. And then to actually um, be there at the time when his um, time for his beating and shouting and so on, we were the students who actually took part in it. And that was phenomenal in, in the sense, and it was emotional as well. But also the janaz of that magnitude was, was tremendous as well. So we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's acceptance of his work and his, his, his time on the face of it. So it was really um, blessed. It was massive because he died somewhere mid-morning, I believe. And, or maybe, I think before Zor. I think before Zor. And his funeral was, the janaz was done right here in Darul Ulum. And it was done, I think, just at Maghrib time. Because in the night we, were, we walked from here to the Mon Road Cemetery. And there were no talks or anything like that. And a lot of people were crying. In fact, someone even fainted on the road walking and who, he got a heart attack. SubhanAllah, yeah, some guy who, who came to the funeral. But it was, it, there was a lot of emotion involved. A lot of people were crying. I was crying, you know, and uncontrollably, all of us. We, we, because he, he, was, he was a champion. He was really, really fantastic, you know, and it was, it was huge. It was a huge, the, the biggest funeral I have attended in my time here in Trinidad. And everybody came, everybody, like everybody, the whole of the, the Muslim Trinidad came here. People came from all over the place, from Mayaro, from down south, because they were his students, you know, and then they loved him and, and people would donate to, to Darul Ulum. He was very, very popular, very popular. Yeah, I definitely remember that those uh, two lasting words of advice, for sure. I never, never forgot those words. And I think that was literally the night before he passed away, you know. Um, and after that, well, I continued in Hillview. And then I think somewhere around 1998 or 99, we both left Hillview. I was in Form 4, I think you were in Form 2. And we went to Darulum. And I finished Form 4 and 5 in Darulum. And then after, of course, I continued uh, the Islamic studies course, which is an Islamic degree, the yes. Alim program. 
and I spent five years after finishing CXC and graduated in 2005 as a, a, you know, with the Islamic degree. And you also. I myself completed at the Darulum until Form 5. Right. And then I, uh, I went on to do the Islamic Studies course, the Allen program. Right. I did a, maybe about one or two years right here at the Darulum. Mm -hmm. And then I went across to Pakistan where I did right. about three years mm -hmm. of studies across there. Right. And then I came back and that's where I completed at the Darulum. So I have been qualified at the Darul. Alhamdulillah. His legacy stretches beyond the walls of the Darul Trinidad and Tobago because of the way he trained his students. His students are out there doing whatever they can to serve the community of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as Grenada, Guyana, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Barbados, America, Canada, England, and many others that I cannot remember. Um, his, his, his vision is also being portrayed in those places from his students who are starting up and bringing about new ideas in education and leadership in their communities. Rashadi Foundation was established to build Muslim communities, to strengthen communities, especially in, in those less unfortunate areas. We started, a, we started a masjid in Madras, which we named after Mufti Shabil, alayhi rahma. And from there, we used it as our base. Then we went to Toko, because he had a concern for Toko. He knew there was absolutely no Islam in Toko. And he always thought about how it is we could get this Islam spread in Toko. We went to Kumana village, which is the middle. I don't know if you know Toko, the middle of the whole road from Mathura to Matlat. So we went there in probably about four years ago and we established a masjid there. Probably, we probably have about 120 Muslims now. When we went to Toko, there's no Muslims. So there's an established masjid with five days maktab. It's a poor community. So the main aim is the children. So one of our main things there is that we'll go to the children's school, we'll interact with the principal and the teachers, and we'll go to the sports day, and we take the responsibility, whole responsibility in school, to make sure they go to school, make sure they have spending money in school. We'll take them from school, we'll bring them to the masjid, we'll, they'll have a snack, we'll teach them the maktab Islamic, we'll do it all day, homework, we'll give them dinner, and then we we'll drop them home. The Rashadi Foundation, I would say, is a great legacy of Mufti Shabil. The reason being is because Mufti Shabil alayhi rahma established the Darul Ulum with a vision, creating ambassadors to go out there and preach and preserve Islam. So when the Darul Ulum would have produ produced alims and shayukh and mashaykh and scholars and imams, the, op the, the opportunity for them now is to go out and to preach and to encourage this knowledge that they have, they have been blessed with. So they would go out to communities now and the Rashadi Foundation, we try to work hand in hand in giving the support to the ulama and the scholars that when they would go to communities that we would be that means of support for them, to give them that extra hand to support them in any aspect of it. So the Rashadi Foundation, not knowing Mufti Shabil personally, but from the, the, all of the inspirational things I've heard from him, I feel like I work directly under him with respect to all of the work that we do. At the Backward Hour Foundation, the activities that we are involved in basically would be on those activities that are surrounding the social aspect of the community, one of them being visiting the old people in our communities and assisting in their home repairs, with need repair, preparing their yard, looking at their yard, from sometimes some medication that some of them would need, we look after that. We also do food and hamper drives to the community, those poor community, people in the community that need that help, families, we provide that for them. We also look at a zakat distribution as well to communities that, in the area that needs that type of help from books to their children, uniforms, we look at food itself, we look at other areas that they may need some little thing in their business help wise, we try to fix all these little things to help them go forward. And we also look at going to the hospital, the next project we have visiting the hospital once a month. And we try to get the other communities involved that if we could go to the hospital at least once per week from each community, that would make a big difference because 
to me when we visit the hospital a lot of people there be it muslims or non muslims they all look towards us you know praying for them and helping them in some way or the other we do that and a little bit of advice and that makes a big difference in the hospital apart from what the doctors would do you know we try our best to help as well in making the environment more comfortable for them um we also involve ourselves in activities that would deal like with education street dawa um, street dawa is one of those educations where we actually go to the communities to bring to light the the affairs or the things that the muslims would do to assist the community we don't just talk about islam you know we don't just let you know this is muslim but we actually tell you that you know what what we could do to make the community a better place a safer place what we could assist in so we share that message with the community it's not more about just spreading dawa per se so in that way we will be able to care and show to the community that you know these are things you can access and this is what we as the dawa foundation can offer and what you can offer as well to the community and assist us as well with so we can build a stronger team to work in the communities with all the different types of challenges that the communities have whatever it is that the community need we try our best to find an agency or if we can do it ourselves or some individual in the community that can contribute to that definitely we are, we are there for that so. and you know concerning the darums construction of masjids and you know masajids throughout the country all different parts this is something that actually started with dad i remember a couple months before he died yeah in about february or march month he had to do the turning ceremony of the first masjid constructed on the darulum which is the one that exists in the darulum school compound now which was um, at the time started by the late hafiz karamat may allah be pleased with him you know and even after he passed away his family continued the legacy and they finished the masjid alhamdulillah to this you know one of the most beautiful mosques we have in trinidad and maybe in the caribbean mufti shabi alaihi rahma was a person who had a vision for the future of islam in trinidad and tobago it is for that reason he brought islamic education from all over the world to the dar ulum in trinidad and tobago and his idea was that nobody should be prevented from seeking islamic education because it's too far away and that's why he brought it here and he encouraged his students to continue to teach islam in their communities and that's also how it is connected to the arangwes masjid this will be one of the places where a person can come and learn about islam in trinidad and tobago the arangwes masjid project is connected to mufti shabil through one of his students by the name of ansar Brother Ansar was a student of Mufti Shabi Allahi Rahma even while Mufti Shabi was teaching at the Nur Islam Masjid and he continued being a student of Mufti Shabi Allahi Rahma when the Dar ul Ulum moved up to Kunupia Brother Ansar saw a need in the Nur Islam area in the Sawan area because of the expansion of the Muslim community he saw a need for a new masjid in a different area but very close by which is in Arangways he had the land and he chose to give the land to the Darul Ulum in order to expand the Muslim ummah in Sao well i was young at that time when my dad consulted with his teachers for us to move towards Haiti Be uh, because what started it was that my dad after the earthquake he went and looked at the population and the muslim situation and then he came back and he told his teachers that in the entire population of Haiti about approximately 13 million there are no scholars present in that island so they told him to go and start the the work and the effort of dean so he he went and he took his entire family and he decided to go so for me i was young so i thought i looked at it as an adventure you know i was excited uh, back then but you know growing up and maturing up looking at the real world and the people around you know in a place that is foreign different language different nationality and different culture so after a while it started to get a bit difficult but then we we still continued serving the people teaching islam so that it started to get easier alhamdulillah now by us there are water supplies electricity so then life became comfortable there my dad has a runs a madrasa a clinic etc across in Haiti If you really look at it the exact same thing Mufti Shabil Allahi Rahma did when he came back from India 
and he he started in Trinidad, he started the Darul Uloom and there was nothing. You know, we had no one doing any sort of big effort on any madrasa system. It is the same pattern that my dad followed in that he went to a, a country that had nothing, nothing Islamic uh, that being done, no scholars, and he started from the scratch. You know, if you were to look back on dad's life, you know, I, I took, a, I took, till today I took lots of examples from, from dad's life. Many a times I would go and um, I would meet people, you know, maybe his mechanic at the time back then, or the person he would go to buy chicken or grocery from, and they would always say, you know, um, I'm not saying he was perfect, but they always made the comment that, you know, uh, I've never seen a man like your dad. I've <laughs> never seen someone like, like your father as yet, you know? Sure. You know, he would, you know, how, how straight he would do, do business, you know, how, <coughs> how proper he would, you know. I always know he has taught his students, because they told me that he would never use, you know, his Islamic knowledge, you know, or his, his going out to study, or all the sacrifice he made to study Islam for, you know, trade it for any worldly benefits, not because he was the first, you know, the first Mufti in Toronto, Tobago, you know, you know, people tell me till today that, you know, try to give him a discount, he said, no, 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 charge me a normal price, I don't yes. want a discount, you know, I don't want to <laughs> owe you, you know, it's not coming back by you again. You know, and um, you know, I never knew him to be a person. You know, he didn't really have time for much as much as he enjoyed sports and hobbies and things. I know his life was a Darul Uloom. You know, I remember although we had so much fun and so on, at the same time sometimes we have to go out for dinner and we would all get ready. And he starts he starts a meeting at after school is over in Darul Uloom at four o'clock. We expect him to be home by around five half five. And sometimes you know those people from the Islamic Development Bank and. We had people visiting from different countries, and when we ha he had guests, sometimes meetings would take five, six hours. <laughs> we had to cancel oh. dinner and things, and <laughs> Darul was always his priority, you know. And down to his last, you know, I have memories of him. I remember he was lying on his, on his bed. He was already taking radiation and so on for the cancer, yes. and he would still be teaching his students at school. You know, that first batch of students that graduated in 1994, <coughs> Mona Abdul Manam, Mona Halim, Mona Gamal. Uh, Mufti Kaya, Mufti Shahid, you know, and mom, of course, is an, the course, only yes. female in that class. You know, so that, that was his dedication down to the last, you know. So, a lot of lessons to be learned, and, you know, as you get older now, like I said sure. earlier, you appreciate things, you, you know, he said to you when you were younger, you know, he would say, become what you want, and I wanted to be a pilot. You know, he <laughs> said, no problem, you can become a pilot, he said, you can become an astronaut. But make sure you have your, a balance, you have your Islamic studies after and your you secular. After you become Alims. Yeah, after you <laughs> become that. And then yeah. even going to school in Hillview, Form 1, Form 2, when you come home in the evening, he would make sure we our, do our Arabic studies as well, on par with whatever Form 1 and Form 2 is doing at, in Darul Uloom. Definitely. A man of great integrity, you know, and uh, I always admired, and from what I've heard, because I was very young when Dad passed. Mm. So, I mean, from his students, like Mufri Abdurrahman and those others, uh, I, I, I know one thing that you heard that was constant was that his work ethic and his tenacity, dedication to the Darulum and to Islam on the whole mm -hmm. was very amazing. Definitely. I mean, if I could be half the person that he was satisfied with I'm that. Satisfied. <laughs> sure, you know? In so many ways, Mufti Shabil's journey reflects that during his lifetime, he led with a purpose. Through his unwavering dedication and faith, he offered himself unconditionally to making a meaningful, lasting, and energizing contribution to humanity by serving a cause greater than his own. Not only did he enjoy his living legacy, he created a pathway for others.